I'm going to start right on time here. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining my class. My name is Marion Landry. I will be presenting on mentoring with the little voice I have today, so you have to, uh, I have to apologize. Um, I lost my voice over the weekend, and this is the best I can do for you. So please bear with me, and I'll try to pass my knowledge, even though I can barely speak. So basically, I'm the uh, technical marketing manager for 3ds Max Design. I am a user first. My two main software are 3ds Max Design and Showcase. So I do production on a regular basis. I produce marketing materials, so I have data sets that I put together in order to use for marketing purposes, such as new feature videos that you guys have seen probably, tips and tricks, training material. So I am a user first. I'm not a marketing person. I live under the marketing umbrella, but I'm uh, working with 3ds Max and Showcase on a regular basis. I've been doing architecture visualization for the last 15, 16 years. I've worked for um, Autodesk for the last five years as a TM. So, and the reason why I wanted to do the, um, the, uh, this class is because for me, when I approach Mentoray, I'd like to you know, categorize it into um, being focused on some of the settings that are important to my case scenario. So I, I thought about an architect or somebody who's doing architecture visualization, and most of the time they have you know, very similar case scenario. You're either gonna render your building outside on the exterior scene, daytime or early morning or late at night, or you're gonna be inside and you're gonna use artificial lighting or you're gonna have uh, the sun, sunshine coming into your room. So those are the main case scenario for architecture rendering and then you throw in the animations in there. So I basically divided rendering into these case scenario and focus on what setting each case scenario need. So it's a lot more simpler when you look at it that way and you're not getting um, you know, scared by this huge panel of settings that you might not use for the case scenario you're dealing with. Um, so that's the reason why I wanted to present this class. I presented it last year and it was quite popular, so I decided to do it again. So basically, when you leave this class here, hopefully you'll leave with information that will help you, um, your, that will increase your understanding of mental ray and help you fine tune your scene and troubleshoot once you go back home. I do have a cheat sheet that I have provided with the handout that gives you a summary of the feet of the settings that you will need per case scenario. So that's a, one thing that's good to keep next to your desk. Um, so overview for the agenda, we're going to look at the basic concept associated with mental race. So what is mental ray and what can we understand about it? How do you prepare your scene before you do mental ray rendering? Um, the four case scenarios for still images and the three case scenario for animations. And then I'm going to have question period. I will have a question period in between the still images and the animation. So if you can keep your question for there, that'd be helpful because there's a lot of material to cover and I really want to cover everything with you today. So basically for um, an overview of the basic concept associated with mental ray. Um, <clears throat> so men mental ray basically is there to give you high quality rendering obviously. And what we try to do for, if you're an architecture firm or if you do architecture visualization, is to recreate reality. So for us, it's really important to be physically accurate. We want to work in a physically accurate environment, so if we place a material on it, we know that the, the reflection is going to be accurate, the lighting is going to be accurate, and it's representing reality. We're trying to get closer to reality because a lot of time we're using the scenes to represent what it's really going to look like once it's built. So for us, it's really important. For film, it's not that important because they try to create fantasy. So, you know, everything is possible for film or game. So we live in a different world. For us, accuracy is quite important. So I'm keeping that in mind when I'm showing you the settings um, that we're going to cover today. Um, how many of you are familiar with um, mental re-rendering? Okay, everybody, awesome, that's great. So final gathering, I'm sure you guys kind of know what that is. I'm gonna just give you a summary. It's a technique basically to estimate indirect elimination, which also is known as global elimination. You can also calculate global elimination with photon, which you know is a technique that you might have dabbled in. It's a lot more complicated than the final gathering. Final gathering is a method recommended for AEC user 
and it's a, me a method um, that I'm using myself, um, and it's also easier, and it's easier to manage, and it gives you really nice and accurate results. So we're not going to call about, we're not going to talk about GI. Why do I need global illumination? Well, the main purpose is that you try to represent reality. And in real life, we have secondary rays and, glo and global illumination. You know, the light, a light will create direct lighting, which will cast a shadow. But it will also create some sort of a light around it, which gives you secondary lighting. So in the, the image on the uh, left side of the screen do have global illumination. And the one on the, on the right doesn't. So the area where you have shadow are very, very dark because there's no light that can enter here if you don't have global illumination. So that's the reason why you want global illumination. Otherwise, your scene looks really um, uh, CG, like they're, don't, they're not really real looking. So how does final gather work, basically? So that's a principle that you need to understand because it's not reality. We're trying to reproduce it. So basically, um, there's a c typical scene here. I have a room, I have a window, I have a sun, and I have a camera, right? So when the final gatherer is enabled, every object um, effectively becomes a source of indirect illumination. So that means that depending on the material that are applied to your object, the light will bounce on it. So that's why there's secondary source of illumination. So first of all, the... Um, the direct light enter your building or your room, so that's called direct light, and it reaches the floor and it will bounce one time. That becomes indirect illumination. Then the camera will send final gather points in the room to find out what's the illumination of that room. Now it's going to send a point to the ceiling, and in order to figure out how bright that point is, it will send secondary rays, so ray per final gather point. So it will send rays randomly in the room that will give light information, and then it gives it an average on that particular point. So let's say that point represents 35,000 lux. Well, the point next to it might represent only five lux because, you know, the secondary ray went around the room, and that's the um, average that it found. So because you can have like light source that are brighter and, and not as bright really next to it, we're going to interpolate in between these points to smooth out the final gather solution. So very technical, but we'll get into it a little more once we get into fine tuning. Why do I need it? Well, basically, if you're rendering a scene indoor that only has a source of light that's coming from the outside, you'll need final gather and global illumination. Otherwise, your room is pitch black. So that's one of the main reasons as well. Now, understanding exposure control, which is another term that we use a lot, which is very important. Basically, exposure control is a plug-in component that adjusts the output level and color range of a rendering. So basically, it adjusts the brightness and contrast of your rendering. So you have to think of yourself as a photographer when you're doing rendering in 3ds Max Design, because you're looking at the scene through a camera. So basically, if you're a photographer and then you take a picture inside and you keep the same setting and you go outside, most likely the picture will be totally over, overwashed. Like it'll be really, really bright because you do need different setting for interior scene that you need for exterior scene. So it's the same principle in 3ds Max design because you're looking at your scene through a camera. So you will need to adjust the exposure control according to the type of scene that you're working with. So basically, this is kind of the principle here. You know, and then, of course, point and shoot camera or you're more experienced photographer. I'm personally, I'm a point and shoot. I like the automatic mode. I don't like to kind of play with the settings. Sometimes I do, but most of the time I like presets, something that gives me some sort of an idea. And I want to have, I want to just press click and the scene is perfect. Well, we have ways to do that in 3ds Max as well. But if you are a more experienced uh, photographer, then you can also fine tune yourself the, the film speed, the aperture, and the, uh, all of these settings that you find on the camera. So how's my voice so far? Can you, people hear me okay? Okay, thank you. That's awesome. 
So basically, this is the control that you have in uh, 3ds Max design. That's called the exposure control. So we recommend we recommend to use mental ray photographic exposure control to render with mental ray, which is you know the matching exposure control for it. And if you're more point and shoot camera, you'll have presets that you can choose from. Those are the presets I like to use, and then I can fine tune the exposure value in the little um, underneath there. But if you're more advanced, you still have options to adjust the shutter speed, the aperture, and the film speed. So this is really up to you, depending on your knowledge of uh, being a photographer. Now, there's another term that we talk a lot about is ambient occlusion. What is ambient occlusion exactly? Ambient occlusion is a method introduced by a film industry to emulate the look of true global illumination using a shader that calculates the extent to which an area is occluded. So basically, ambient occlusion exists in real life. We just don't notice it. So what happens is that when two objects are close to each other, they stop the light from entering this area that is really close in between. So it happens a lot in between two walls, underneath your chair. If you place your hands close to the table, you'll see it. You'll see the shadow, but you'll also see the ambient shadow that's being created from two objects being close. Well, in 3D, we need to make this process an artificial process because it doesn't exist until we force it to exist. But it will add a lot of realism to your scene. So for example, it, you'll be able to you'll be better able to see the final details and understand how the scene goes. So I have different examples here. For curtains, for example, if you have a look at the curtains in the pictures, there's a lot of ambient shadow in there. You just don't notice it because it's so natural. But in, in 3D, we need to simulate that in order to see the fold of the curtains. So there's two ways to create ambient shadow. In, I keep calling it ambient shadow. In 3ds Max Design, it's called ambient occlusion, and in Showcase, it's called ambient shadow. So it gets really confused in my mind. It's both the same thing, so I don't want to confuse you. Um, there's two ways to um, create ambient occlusion in 3ds Max Design. You can either do it on the material level, so you can tell your material to cast uh, ambient occlusion. So basically, you enable it at the material level. So on the architecture and design material, there's a, um, a tab that's called special effect, and you just enable it as well as on the Autodesk material. Or you can also create a special shader that's called ambient occlusion, and then um, add it later on in post-processing, such as After Effects or Photoshop. So there's a shot here that doesn't have ambient occlusion, and then you see it after. So I'm going to do before and after. Before and after. So you notice it a lot in the curtains, underneath the table, and underneath the um, cycle machine. Right? So it adds a lot of realism. To the untrained eye, you won't be able to be like, oh, there's no ambient occlusion. But you'll look at the scene and you'll be like, ah, oh, it looks CG. Because everything is kind of floating and it doesn't, doesn't really look real. So something to keep in mind when you're doing render rendering. Now, we do have a, a simplified mental ray rendering panel, and that basically helps you to uh, guide you through the settings that you will need in uh, rendering with mental ray. So basically, it's designed to reduce the learning curve for a new user, the simplified mental ray panel, and also accelerate test render so you can tune down the settings so you can have a less refined image or you can increase the settings to have a more refined image very quickly. So that also allows you to gain quality or speed depending on the type of rendering that you're trying to do. So this is, but you know, everything that exists in the simplified mental ray panel also exists in the main mental ray panel. There's a quick question behind. Yeah, of course, because that's, um, okay, you have to think about this. If you're a photographer and you take a picture inside, the outside will be overwashed. This is a natural principle. You can't balance both scenes. It's impossible, and it happens in real life as well. The only case scenario where both scenes will be balanced is that if you have a later time of the day or if outside is in the shade. That's a natural process because this light source outside is really bright. In this case, it's not really overwashed on the outside because it's in a shaded area. That's why. 
So basically, um, in the um, simplified mental ray panel, if I adjust the soft shadow precision quality, it does, you know, it's a, it's a shortcut to other, other settings that exist in, in um, 3ds Max design. So if I adjust the soft shadow precision, what that slider does is that it refines the quality of my mental ray sky portal or of my light. You know, you see on my uh, daylight system, I have the shadow softness sample at the bottom here. And on the mental ray sky portal, I have the shadow sample, which are set to 16. If I adjust the soft shadow precision slider, those are the two settings that get affected. So you have to be aware of what you're doing here. The glossy reflection precision, when you adjust the setting in the um, simplified mental ray panel, what it does is that it, effect, it affects every single material in your scene that has glossy sample, right? So globally, you're adjusting every single material in your scene that has glossy reflection precision. Same thing for the glossy refraction precision. You'll ex uh, you will be adjusting globally on the level of your scene every single material that have glossy sample. So when you're decreasing the sample, it's great because it renders really fast, but if you're increasing the sample, you have to be aware that every single material gets affected. So is this really what you want, or you want to fine tune it on the material level? Sometimes it's good to find a happy medium where it's rendering fast enough, and to just fine tune either the daylight system or one of the mental ray, of the, uh, mental ray sky shader, uh, sorry, the mental ray sky portal, or maybe one of the material that you need more precision. Instead of increasing your um, slider globally, and then you're majorly increasing rendering time, and you don't know why. So image precision, what is that exactly? I'm still talking here about the um, mental resimplify uh, rendering panel. So what does image precision affects in your rendering when you decrease or increase the setting? It's basically the anti-aliasing. So the line or the edges of your, of your models of your object will be kind of jittered if you have a very low setting. So that's a setting that we normally keep quite high. The normal, most of the scene that I'm using is 116. I've never, very rarely I've gone higher than that. Soft shadow precision, you'll see that if you look at the chair, the shadow of the chair, if it's very low, the soft shadow precision is really grainy, it's really high, it becomes a bit more soft. Now, how close are you from the object? Maybe it doesn't really make any sense to make that setting really high for the type of scene that you're dealing with. So it's always really project relevant and how close are you from the object. Glossy reflection precision. This is the reflection, the, the, pre the precision of the reflection in an object. So you see here I have a wall that's really reflective in the back. And then if I have a very low setting, that reflection is a little grainy. If I have a really high setting, that reflection is really sharp. Do you see any difference? A little bit, right? So that setting is not that important, most case scenario. Unless you are focusing your camera on a reflection, that setting is not that important. So don't crank it up and increase your rendering time if you don't need it. So be focused on what you're trying to achieve. Glossy refraction is the same principle very apparent on, on glass material. So for example, if you have a very high quality, the glass will have some sort of a, um, a soft reflection, a soft refraction in it, which almost looks like foggy. If you have a very low reflection, it looks like pure glass. So what are you trying to achieve? Do you have a frosted glass in your scene where you have, you know, you need the high quality? If you don't have any frosted glass, then maybe that setting doesn't need to be really high. Or maybe you need to fine tune it on the material level instead of increasing that setting globally for every material that have transparency in your scene. Trace bounce limits, that's a tricky one. How do we understand that? There's a room here, which a mannequin that is surrounded by glass, by mirror, and the reflection of this is, is infinite. You can see the reflection on, you know, forever. Now that's the reality. In real life, I've recreated that scene. I have a chair, a ball, and there's two mirror uh, wall on the side. Right now, I have no maximum reflection, so it doesn't reflect anything. There's no reflection happening. 
What happened if I increase to one maximum reflection? It reflect, the reflection happened once. It's bouncing the reflection only one time. Two maximum reflection, oh, now it's starting to look a little bit more real because there's a reflection in the reflection. Maximum three, starting to be a little, little bit more real because now the reflection is starting to be perpetuate, right? It happens three times. I crank it up to six. Did you notice any difference? Okay, look closer. Three, this is three, this is six. This is three, this is six. Now there's a reflection on the floor in the reflection of the chair. There's a slight reflection on the ball of the reflection. So you have to be aware, why would you crank up that, that, that setting if you don't need it and you can't even tell the difference? Now that's a very specific case scenario. Are you going to model ever a room with mirror wall? Maybe not. So basically, you know, most of the time you'll have um, a, maybe walls that are really reflective. So you'll have a maximum reflection of two and that's good enough for what you need because the reflection is not that sharp and you don't really see the difference. So run some tests. You know, maximum two reflection normally is that what I need, I need for my scene and I get high quality results. There's always some exception and those are some things that you need to understand here. The, trans, the maximum refraction, for example, I don't know why they call it refraction. I find it really confusing myself because it's really transparency or opacity map. Okay, so when you see refraction, think about transparency. Let's clear that one out of the way. You have a scene here and let's say you have a staircase that is all made of glass and it's in a rotation like this. So there's multiple plane of glass that the transparency trace needs to go through. Now each polygon is an object, right? So normally a, a glass plane is a cube, so it's got two polygons to go through. So the refraction, the maximum refraction bounce, it's calculated into number of polygons. So if you have four maximum refraction, it's going, the transparency is going through four polygons. So if you look at the first image, I don't see the ball after four polygons. So the first two glass plane, I can see the, the transparency, but the third one, it doesn't go through because I don't have enough, my, my trace bounce is not high enough. If I increase it to six, it goes through the sixth polygon of transparency. So, you know, you have some case scenario, where let's say if you have this glass staircase, you'll have to have quite a high level amount of refraction uh, limits because it's, it's going to have to go through a lot of different polygon uh, of the transparency. Same thing for opacity map. You know, if you have a bunch of trees or tree clusters, it's going to need a higher amount of um, maximum refraction. All right, trace um, bounce limits, final gather bounce limits. That's also a tricky one. This setting is very, very important for interior scene. It doesn't make any more sense for exterior scene. Exterior scene, normally, I leave it to zero because you have the uh, indirect illumination from the sky. It makes a lot of sense inside because you do want the light to travel and bring a nice global illumination feeling to the scene. So basically, let's think about this here. This is really material dependent. So you have the scene outside, the sun outside. It's entering your scene at a thousand lux, a hundred thousand lux. It goes to your floor. Your floor has a material that is maybe 50% reflected, right? It reflects only 50% of light. So when the bounce, after the first bounce, your light is now only 50,000 um, lux. It's no longer 100,000 lux, it's only 50,000 lux. Then it's going to go and bounce on the wall. That's also 50% reflectant. So the second bounce will only reflect 25,000 lux. And then after the, 12, uh, the third bounce, the light is really diffuse. So it's not that bright anymore. So do you really need six bounce? Maybe not, because maybe it doesn't really make a, a big difference. And maybe your wall is only 10% reflectant anyways. So by the time the light has traveled three bounce, there's no more light. So it really depends on what kind of scene you're dealing with and how reflectant your material are. So here's an example of an interior scene with zero bounce, one bounce, two bounce, and three bounce. After that, I didn't even bother to render because the difference was not even clear or that obvious. 
Obviously, my, you know, I'm not really refined in my rendering here because I wanted you to understand and see the final gather points. So when I say that it's color dependent, obviously a white wall will reflect more light than a dark gray wall because the reflectance value are different. How do you find out reflectance value? When you buy a slip of color at the hardware store, it always gives you a L LRV, um, LRV um, amount on the back of the chip. So the LRV amount, um, I can never remember what LRV stands for, light reflectance value, there you go. So basically, depending on the color, um, it will have a different uh, reflectance value. So how do we translate that in mental ray? When you look at the material panel, there's a reflectance value for each of the materials. Basically, this material that I have selected is 73% reflectance. Now, how do you adjust that? Basically, it's based on the color. So when you adjust, you know, when you pick a color in the color picker, the value amounts at the bottom is the reflectance value. So if it's a 0.84, it will reflect 84%. It's a 0.2, it will reflect only 2%. Now, the same thing is, is true with a bitmap. You know, you would have to load your bitmap in Photoshop and find out what's the average um, reflectance value from Photoshop or from any other software that can give you this information. So here I have two different rendering, which are using uh, colors that are both 50% reflectance. So it's not an amount of color, it's, it's a, it's, it, it works on reflectance value. So if not because it's brown, then it's reflecting less. If the brown value is as high as a gray value, then it's reflecting the same amount. All right. So that's kind of like the basic of our mental ray work. Now you need to prepare your scene in order to render with mental ray. And there's few things that you need to keep in mind when you do that. <coughs> there, you need to use light, obviously. Lights that are uh, suggested for mental ray rendering are men, um, mental ray daylight system or photometric light, which are uh, giving you accurate value. Material, geometry, direct illumination, and indirect illumination, and camera exposure. This is like the principle of what you need to render a mental ray scene. Something very important is to check your unit scale. You need to work in a proper unit scale because we're trying to reproduce reality. If you work in a really small scene and you plug a light that is a different scale, you're going to have like way off results. So you need to make sure that your units are real. So if you're working on the stadium, you know, make sure that it's like a certain amount of feet wide or whatever. So always check, especially when you import a project, make sure that you're working in the same units that the project was built from the original software. So if it was built in feet and inches, then work in feet and inches in max. It's a common mistake. So I have this mistake on a regular basis. People are like asking me questions and they're like, I don't understand why I put a light and it's so bright and everything is corrected. And then you're like, did you check your unit? Oh, sorry. So, you know, it happens all the time. It even happened to me still once in a while when I'm like a bit sleepy and I'm like importing something, not checking my unit scale. Very mistakes. So don't think that you're above it. Always double check it. Recommended lights or a mental ray um, daylight system and photometric light. And the reason why uh, we say photometric light is because um, their energy computation is physically based. So which makes them an ideal source for indirect elimination calculation. The main reason is that the energy is used in the indirect elimination process will always be in balance. So that's what you want. You want the reality. It'll be in balance with the energy used for the direct elimination. So if I have a sun, it's got a certain amount of lux. If I put a photometric light, the lux will be in balance with the sun. It's not going to overpower the sun, obviously. You can also load IES data information that comes from the light manufacturer. And also, decrease, the light intensity will decrease naturally according to the type of lights that it is. So if it's a spotlight or halogen light, the light intensity will, re will decrease according to real life uh, numbers and values. 
Recommend, recommended material type are the architecture and design material as well as the Autodesk material. And the reason for that is because they're a physically accurate material, so they're based on real world values. Um, so there is a lot of research in, involved in these materials to create them internally to make sure that they are giving you accurate results. Um, so that's the reason. And modeling in general, make sure that your modeling is airtight, you know, you got the smooth angle, the flip, there's no flip normal, so there's no abnormality in your model, that the polygon counts as high enough to give you nice results, and stuff like that that are general knowledge. But, you know, once in a while you download a model from TurboSquid or any other source, and it looks like crap because it's been badly modeled. So don't ask yourself why it's not working. All right. Rendering still images. Let's get started. So four different scenarios um, when, when you're rendering. So there's one thing that it's important to understand here is that I'm giving you the basic. And I really hope that from the basic, you're going to bring it to the next level. Right? You can always add particle animation, motion blur, depth of field, render element, do post-processing. You, know, you can create non-photorealistic shaders. And all of that. Mental Ray is very flexible. You can throw anything at it. It will render any type of material. You can really be creative with it. But once you know the basic, you can go really far after that. But the basic is important, right? So let's see for the first scene. So my, our first scene is going to be an exterior scene during daytime, which is the simplest scene to render. Yep. No. Well, yes, you will because it's material dependent. Okay, so he's, he's asking, okay, let's say I'm, calcul I'm, I'm, I'm rendering. I can answer it at the end a little bit more. But I have a scene and I have some material in it, and I'm calculating my final gather raise, you know, in my final gather pass, and I go and change my material. Well, then, yeah, if you change it for like 80% reflecting material, and at first you're 20%, the bounce will be different. But if they're more, the, the reflectance value of your material are the same, then it'll be the same. It's not a matter of colors and amount, it's a matter of reflectance value. Okay? All right, so the exterior daylight is the simplest scene to understand and the quicker to render, the quicker to fine tune as well. So you have a before here, very basic rendering, and this is one I enhance it. So I'm adding, you know, a particle and a little bit of glow here and there. So, you know, before and after. So I highly suggest that you enhance your scene every time you render them. So create, um, let's look at the steps involved in creating a daylight system, um, an exterior scene during daytime. <laughs> Well, sorry, I have a very low resolution. <laughs> okay. So basically, this is an exterior scene. Um, the first thing that you want to make sure um, is to create a daylight system. Very simple. You go in there, and automatically, it's going to switch it to mental ray exposure control. So you're going to say yes, and it's going to dump a sky. And then you're basically creating a daylight system into your scene. You know, very simple so far. So the second thing you need to do is ex adjust your exposure value. So here you got your mental ray sky system. And we're going to adjust the exposure value. And like I said earlier, you know, I'm a person who likes presets. So I'm using the preset that is an outdoor daylight. And I'm keeping it to the exposure value that it's giving me by default. I can always fine tune it later. Then I go to my camera. Of course, I'm going to want to see this effect in my scene. So I'm going to switch to a realistic view and show the um, shadows and ambient shadows and show the background, right? So I have direct feedback visually in my scene. Then I'm going to go under rendering, and I'm not adding any final gather bounce. I'm just clicking render, and I'm getting a really nice uh, scene already. Of course, I can change the time of the day. I can readjust the exposure value. But this scene is very simple. You basically you know, create a daylight system, adjust the exposure control, no bounce, render, bang, you're good to go, right? You can enhance it from there, add clouds in your rendering, whatever you want. And you notice that my settings are really low. Um, they're really, the glossy, you know, glossy reflection precision is very low. Glossy refraction precision is very low. I do have a water uh, here, and you can see that in the water is very grainy. So in that particular case, I will go on that uh, 
specific material and increase the glossy refraction in, of this material. But I wouldn't do it globally on the scene because I have a lot of glass and metals and I don't need to do it everywhere else than for the water. I'm also only using a maximum reflection of one, a maximum refraction of three. So very simple settings here. So very basic here. So the exterior time, uh, daytime, the exterior scene during daytime to fine tune. Um, there's a couple of tips, of course. You know, you, um, you always have to ask yourself, do you need to increase the quality setting globally or on the material level, like I just said? And look at the nature of your scene and decrease or increase the settings accordingly. Lots of water, lots of reflection, maybe not a lot of reflection. So depending on the nature of your scene, the precision will be different. For most scene, I don't add any bounce for um, the exterior scene because, because you have a sky and the sky will give you indirect illumination. It's the main source of indirect illumination, so secondary light. That's why you don't need bounce because of the sky and you only exterior. Um, illumination of the surface is provided by the Mentori sun and, finer ga and final gather and not the environment map. So often we think that, you know, the gradient of the environment, you know, that you see in the background, this is what the illumination is. That's not true. That's just a visual reference that gets adjusted with the time of the day. But basically what gives you the, um, the indirect illumination is the mental ray uh, sky. So that's the illumination value that you need to focus on. The ground has an effect on indirect illumination. So let's say you have you know, a small building and a huge grass field around it, you'll notice that your wall will be greenish. So it will bounce, it's because the light bounces on the ground that is green and the light becomes green on the wall. So um, often I have that question, why is my ceiling so green? Well, like the polygon underneath is like super green. So you might want to reduce the value, the reflectance value of that grass. Sometimes to the untuned eye, we tend to make our material very bright and very uh, high, with a high reflectance value. So you can t tone your material and it looks more realistic. Uh, the sun and sky intensity is affected by the time of the day. So, you know, if you are changing the time of the day to be earlier on, you might have to readjust your exposure value, obviously. The mental ray exposure control I'm talking about. The larger the render, the higher the quality precision you'll need. So if you render a very large render, you'll need more precision quality because then you can see the details a little better. And it's a good idea to find an average precision quality for the glossy and refraction, refraction precision and increase it only on the material that need it the most. So don't do it globally. Find a setting that works globally and then fine tune only the material that needs higher precision. Okay, so let's look at a night scene or dawn or dusk. Well, I'm impressed with my voice. It's all, all hanging on. So again, this is the basic rendering and this is after I kind of enhance it. Again, there's particle flow, um, sorry, particles uh, for the water, you know, there's little characters and, you know, I'm adding glow to the lights, you know, I'm making the sky a little bit more punchy. So keep that in mind when you're rendering. So night scenes are a little bit more tricky because artistic skills are going to be needed. Because you need to understand a little bit about light. If you're going to include artificial light, you can't just like be like, oh, let's put this light, this light, this light, and expect it to look good. You need to understand what kind of light you're using, what's their intensity, how far, you know, what kind of light effect you're looking at. I'm not a, I'm not a light person at all. What do I do? I open magazines and I look what other people do and I try to reproduce it. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not by no means like an expert light person. You know, for me lighting was very difficult to understand. So I had to observe what other people do and copy it. So that's what something I say to people. Keep images reference next to your desk. See how the light is. You know, what kind of like light effect is that? It is brighter at the top, then it fades away right away. Why? Oh, it's because there's an edge there. You know, have a look at what's happening in real life and try to reproduce it. 
That's what makes your scene look real when you try to reproduce exactly what's happening in real life. So let's look at the, um, the steps involved in creating a dawn scene. So I am starting to, I'm starting from the last scene that I had, which was a day scene. So often that's what happened. You'll create a daylight, then you're, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to create like a nice quality shot. It's going to be a bit more impressive. So you are starting from a day scene. So how do you do to transform it into a night scene? So first thing you'll need to do is change the time of the day to a late night or early morning. So I'm changing that to be 7 p.m. Then after, unfortunately, you notice that I changed the time of the day, but the multiplier, like the intensity of light, didn't change. So the sun is as bright at noon as it is at 9 in the morning. And I don't know why that doesn't get adjusted. I find that really annoying, and it took me for ages to figure it out. So if you're going to do a day, like a scene early morning or early or late at night, you need to reduce the multiplier of the sun and the sky or shut it off altogether. So what I do here is I reduce it to 0 0.01. So almost no uh, illumination. Right? So you see, it's very dark. The reason for that is because I haven't changed my exposure control. So now it's a different uh, time of the day, so I can choose a preset where I can change the exposure value manually. So I'm going to make it close to what I think it should be uh, when it's a scene that is that late at night. So there's a little bit of brightness, but it's not so bright for now because I don't have artificial light. So if I render that, I get a nice result. You know, it's dark enough. It looks realistic. It looks like it's matching my sky. Then from there, I start to add my artificial lights. Of course, um, you know, I have created the lights already, so I can just open my light lister and turn them back on. So as you're adding light, artificial, uh, lights, artificial light source, you might have to fine-tune your exposure control because you're increasing the light intensity in your scene, and the exposure control might, be, might need to be a little bit fine-tuned at the end. So I'm just bringing back my lighting here, turning it back on. Do you guys use the light lister at all? Light lister is very cool because it lists all your lights and your scene. You can change the intensity, you can change the color, you can see uh, what's happening in your scene, which lights are on or off. And you can also, if you duplicate your lights, you'll see the light list. So as you're adjusting them, you will see uh, the results on all the other lights. So I use the light lister tremendously every time I do interior scenes. So I'm going to go back to my exposure control and fine tune the result here. So maybe lower it a little bit so I have a little bit more contrast. And I'm going to hit render and it should give me a nice result. Very bad idea to be sick in Vegas. Really not fun. All right. So now I have a nice um, scene which has, you know, a daylight which is in balance with my artificial lights. So basically, there is a render. The first render is with the daylight system only, which is nice, but there's no light, and that's not really close to reality. A building always have artificial lights, and after it's the daylight system with photometric lights. So tips and tricks around that, how to fine-tune it. Um, illumination of the surface is provided by the mental ray sun and final gather and not the environment map. So the intensity adjustment must be made on the daylight system. The environment map shader only affects the background and reflection from specular surface like floors and water. So what that means is that you know, the, the, the sky that you have there is only visible to reflection. It's not really the intense, it's not really, it's just a shader, it's just there to make it beautiful. It, re, it shows in the reflection. But you do need to adjust the intensity of the mental ray sun under the panel like I showed you, right? So if you change the time of the day, it's very important to change the intensity manually. 
it will change the intensity of the look of that shader and it will change you know the look of the reflection of that shader but the shader is not the intensity of the sun, of the sky so you have to change that manually um, you know if there's a light plan that exists with your design ask for it and follow it so you have a good idea of where the client is trying to go then you can get artistic from it because sometimes you know just because you know you're the artist you might want to increase certain things or add little details but if there's a light plan it's a really good idea to ask for it and try to download the IES um, photometric information from the light manufacturer which are always available by the way so you can load them into your photometric light in 3ds max design instancing the light is a really good idea so if you create let's say if you would do this room here these lights are all the same so you create one you instance all the other ones so if you go to the light lister or even to any of the light and you change the property all the lights are being adjusted at the same time so you know that you know you don't have to go one by one by one so you're saving tremendous amount amount of time so using the light lister is really good for that because you have an idea of which light is in your scene I, you can rename them ceiling lights, table lights, you know, accent lights, whatever you want. And then you change the intensity of all the same lights at the same time. But exterior scenes are the most um, easy to create. So keep that in mind. Complication comes when you go inside and then you have different source of light. So let's start to have a look at these scenes. And stereo scene uh, with sunlight entering through a window or doors. So this scene will need a daylight system, a mentor ray sky portal, and multiple final gather bounds. Final gather bounds are really important for interior scene. Oops, I'm gonna put it there. Oh. Okay, let's have a look at how we can create that. So the exterior principle that you just learned will apply to this interior scene in a weird way. So let's think about this as two steps. So first, you have the camera inside, and this is the scene that you're trying to render. But first, you'll need to go outside and create your daylight system. So I'm going to go outside of this model and create my daylight system, like I did earlier on with the exterior scene. So I'm dropping my, my exterior, my daylight system in the scene, and I'm going to adjust the time of the day. I'm going to show the realistic view so I have direct feedback and I can see visually what's happening in my viewport. I'm going to adjust the time of the day. So I'm taking it to 3 p.m., I think. Okay, that's all really nice, but right now, if you go inside, there's no light source. Make sure that the light is entering through the window if you want to see it inside, right? So I'm going to have to rotate my compass and make sure that the sun is entering through my room. That's common mistake number two. I can't see the sun. Well, did you rotate it? Because <laughs> if it's not entering the building, there's no light source that's coming in, right? If you're sitting in the shadow, it's not going to be really bright. So the light is entering my building. This is great. I'm going to adjust my exposure control, right? So I have my sky. Perfect. I'm going to change to mental ray photographic exposure control and make sure that it's adjusted to the outdoor daylight clear sky. And then when I render, it renders fine. I need to know that it's rendering fine first in the exterior scene before I move inside. If it's not working outside, it's not going to work inside, right? All right. So now I know that it's working fine on the outside. It's working great. I'm going to move inside. Oh, no. First of all, I'm going to create a mental ray uh, sky portal. The mental ray sky portal basically what's going to happen is going to indicate this, uh, it's going to indicate where the light source should come in. So basically instead of like, you know, just sending lights everywhere in your scene, it's going to say, hey, by the way, this is where the light should be entering. So it's focusing the ray of light through this opening or through these windows. So that's all it's doing because you want the light to go there and you want to have the ray of light to be focused on these area so they come inside of your space. So that's why the mental ray sky portal are quite important. So I'm going to create mental ray sky portal into my window and I'm going to make sure that the arrow is pointing towards the inside. 
very easy. I can copy it. And I'm going to move inside. Very dark. Why is it very dark? Because I haven't adjusted my exposure control. Awesome. People are following. I love that. So because I'm inside now, it's an indoor scene, I'm going to go and adjust my exposure control to a preset of an indoor scene. I really love presets. Pre By the way, presets exist because of me. Because when I first started working at Autodesk, I was like, can I just have presets? You know, give me something to start with. I don't know what's the exposure value. So I'm really proud to say that they're there because of me. So anyways, so this is, the, so I adjusted my exposure control and I did a little render preview and I'm getting some sort of something in there. So I'm quite happy with that and I can, I can go and fine tune it. So basically, I'm going to open my rendering window, and I'm going to make sure that I have three final gather bounce. Because if I don't have any final gather bounce, it's not going to give me really nice results. So I'm going to start with three, because I know for a fact that most of the time, if I use three for an interior scene, it's going to give me good results. And I'm going to hit render. Sometime, in some a small, small case scenario, you'll have two final gather bounce, and it will give you a good result. Final gather bounce, the more you have, the slower your, round, your render will be. So, you know, if you can get away with two final gather bounce and have a faster render, please, by all means, you know, use it. So really scene dependent, but most case scenario, three final gather bounce will give you good results. So, of course, for the interior scene, the challenge is to refine the mental resetting for the interior scene. So you need to understand what you're doing here. So first of all, Understanding the, fi the final gather preset slider. So this is in my mentor main rendering window. So basically, you have the final gather uh, precision preset, and you have these presets that go uh, draft, uh, medium. I can't remember the name of it, but I have a little video here. Hold on. Yeah, so this is... You know, in, the, uh, in this simplified rendering panel, you have draft high, very high, but it also exists in the rendering panel, the main panel under the indirect illumination tab. And basically what it does is, is adjusting these, um, these points, your initial final gather point density, ray per final gather point, and interpolate over number of final gather points. All right, this sounds really complicated, but it's not, and let me explain it to you. So basically, these, these presets, this is the preset I don't really like. They give you some sort of an indication of what you should aim to, but I don't find them really refined for interior scene. So I normally do my own presets. So let me explain you why I do my own presets, because these numbers are really high. The higher you go, the slower it is to render. So basically, what point does what? So think about at your scene that we had at the beginning. I have a scene, I have a sun, and I have a camera. The light enters the building and goes onto the ground for one bounce, and it creates the indirect illumination. <coughs> the camera, to find out this indirect illumination, will send one final gather point, right, or multiple, but let's think of it of one final gather point, to find out what's the elimination of that particular place on the ceiling, it will send secondary rays, which are called rays per final gather point, which are sent randomly into your scene. Then it's going to find out that it's a certain amount of lux, and it's going to do that for all the final gather points. Now, if you have two points that have different value very close to each other, you're going to have a splotch of really bright light, and maybe something that's not so bright next to it. So in order to smooth out the solution, we're going to interpolate across multiple points. That's what these numbers are for. So basically here, I've diagnosed, you know, there's a, in the process tab of the mental ray panel, there's a diagnostic uh, option that you can render the final gather points to see what they look like. These are the final gather points, the little green dots. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm giving you the example of the draft uh, solution here. So the draft solution, the initial final gather point density is very low. There's not that many final gather points. And it's, it's sending secondary rays, you know, to find out the intensity of these lights. It's sending 50 rays to find out what each point value is. 
Then it's interpolating across 30 points that are all close from each other. Right? So what's happening is that that solution is not really smooth. If you look at the result, it's very splotchy. Okay, is it because I don't have enough point density, or is it because it's not sending enough rays to find out the intensity, or is it because it's not interpolating across more, more points? Well, let's have a look at what we do here. I'm going to increase the final point density. So I'm going to send more final gather points in my scene. But I'm not going to change any other settings. It didn't really help much, right? There's more, there's more points. You can see that the dots are smaller, but it's, it's not very nice looking, right? Because it's not interpolating across more multiple points. So let's see if I increase the interpolation number, but I keep the final gather points really low and the raper final gather points really low. Look at that. Much better. So the more interpolation I get, the smoother the final gather solution is. So the, you understand that the interpolation number is quite important. But, you know, it's not really precise. If you look at the render, everything looks like it's floating. Well, you don't have enough precision because you don't have enough final gather points. So you kind of have to find a happy medium. So let's say I have initial final gather point density very low, and I have more rays to find out the numbers of these final gather points, I'm increasing it to 500, very smooth solution, and it's starting to be a little bit more accurate, right, compared to what I had at the beginning. So here, basically, what you need to find is a balance in between all of that. But of course, it's very scene dependent. So you need to find a balance of, you don't want to send too many final gather points because it's going to take much more time to render. But if you send like an average density, this is kind of my solution that I use most case scenario. 0.4, I find, gives me really good results. And then I keep in mind that the ray per final gather points, let's say I put 300, half, I need half of this number for interpolation. Let's say I would increase it to 500, I would need 250 for the interpolation. So the interpolation number is always at least half of the amount of ray per final gather point. That's what I find, oops, sorry, that's what I find the solution for me has been working most case scenario. There's always exception, but that's kind of like a, a bake solution if you want. And of course, you need to add ambient occlusion after that, because without ambient occlusion, everything is floating. So you have without and after with the ambient occlusion, and things really start to look like they belong. Now, the other thing that I'm doing here is I'm fine-tuning my final gather solution with one material. First of all, it's going to render faster, and I'm not going to be distracted by the textures or the material or the reflectance value, right? So I'm giving an average of like 40% reflectance value, white material on everything, and I fine-tune my final gather solution. So I use the overwrite um, material under the mental ray panel to do that. And that's always what I do. Every single time, every single scene, I fine tune my final gather solution with a white material, which is about 40 to 50% reflectance. Then when I'm happy with that, I bring back the material. And sometimes I need to fine tune it a little bit, bit more, but very rarely. So that's also another tip. So basically here you have multiple steps before and after. So before adjusting the exposure control, very dark, and it's one, one um, mis commonly mistakes that people do. Then after adjusting the exposure control, but I don't have any bounce here. So interior with the sky portal will focus the lights inside. So it would bring the light intensity inside my scene. So you see there's a big difference with and without the mental ray sky portal. And then with the, sky, the, the mental ray sky portal and the three final gather bounce starts to look a lot more realistic. There's not a huge difference. You'll notice it's a slight difference, but it will add realism to your scene. Okay, so because I have tested my scene with a white material, you might need to readjust uh, the exposure value once you bring back the texture and the material, because some of the material might not be as reflective or might be more reflective than the general white material that you've been using. So you'll be able, you'll have maybe to readjust a little bit the exposure value. 
So a couple of things to keep in mind here. Uh, you might have object obstructing the window, such as blind curtains or semi-transparent panel, which will block the light from coming in the windows. Uh, there's a couple ways around that. You can increase the amount of ray per final gather points to make sure that they're, you know, that the light is coming through. Or you can increase the amount of final gather bounce. What do I do? I make the objects in the window invisible to the uh, final gather solution. So basically, I don't want any of the final gather points to get stuck in my blinds, especially bl blinds or killers, because there's all these little slab. So I make them invisible to my final gather solution. So basically, I keep the, they're still going to cast shadow, but the points of your final gather solution is not going to get stuck in there. Uh, how many more mental ray sky portal do you need? So you have to be focused here because men, adding mental ray sky portal will uh, slow down your rendering the more you have. So let's say you you have this room here and these two big mirror will be um, windows. Well, if I'm looking at this camera view, I'll probably need two mental ray sky portal. But if I'm looking at that view, maybe I don't need any. Try one. Sometimes I do a big one to indicate that's where the light source is. You know, so it depends on which camera view you're looking at and where the more, where do you want the lights to be the most important. Sometimes you can't get away with it. You're going to have to add five because there's five very important source of light. But sometimes you have a sky, uh, a sky dome or something like a, a skylight. And that's the main source of light that you want. Yeah, you have little windows there, but they're in the shadow or something. So it depends on your scene. I can't really answer that question, but you have to think about where the most important source of light is for your scene. Now, if you have, if you're in the atrium, let's say like, you know, this, this would be uh, a window, which would be nice, but never mind. This is a big window and you see the light is coming in. You don't need a mental ray sky portal. The window opening is so big into your scene, the light will come in, don't worry about it. So it's only when you have small openings that you really need to indicate the light source to come in. So this is what I was telling you about. Uh, the, there's object under the object property. You can tell these objects to be invisible to final gather. Very important for say, if you have a tree that sits outside of your window, it is made of these hundreds of little polygons, right? And then you start your final gather solution. Final gather will be like, oh my God, look at this tree. It needs a lot of points. Let's focus all the points on this tree because there's all these little polygons where like next to it, there's big walls and a couch. So all your rays are going to be stuck in that trees and none of it's going to be into your inside where you really need it. So make sure that that tree is not part of the final gather solution because all your points will be lost on the tree and it's outside and it's just secondary in your render. Right? So maybe sometimes some of the objects don't need to be part of your final gather solution. They will still be eliminated, they will still receive light, but they're not going to be calculated under your final gather uh, solution. All right, so the last scene for the interior is using artificial light only. So we no longer have a source of, our, of daylight system here. So this is the before and after. So obviously I've added accessories, a little flame, glowing light, secondary lights that don't really make sense, but they're just there to make the render a little bit more beautiful. Right? So let's have a look on how we can do that. Okay, we're doing good. Okay, so here I have this scene that I have a daylight system in there uh, to start with. And first thing I'm going to do is uh, look at my scene, and there's a mental ray sky portal. I'm doing only artificial light now, so I'm going to have to turn off that, men that mental ray sky portal. Otherwise, the light source is going to still think that it's coming from there. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it off. I can delete it if I want, but sometimes I like to keep it in the scene if I want to bring back the scene to uh, being a daylight. So I have a daylight system outside, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to turn it off completely. So no longer, it's no longer there. Now, you remember the shader? You know, every time you create a daylight system, it creates a mental ray 
um, um, a sky shader, which is the blue gradient, that shader is still there. And that shader does what? It affects reflection. It will show in the reflection. So if I don't remove that shader and I render, it's still going to show in my reflection. And I have a, I have an image later on to show you. So I have to go under the environment and remove that shader so it doesn't show in the reflection anymore. That's a very common mistake. People forget to do that. I'll show you what it looks like after when you forget. Then I'm going to go back inside and to make sure that it's fine, I'm going to render and I should have a completely pitch black scene. So that's what I have now. So I'm starting for like total pitch black. So I'm going to adjust my exposure control to be an in indoor night scene. So I will have some sort of, you know, brightness, but very, very low. And then I'm going to start adding my artificial lights. So obviously, again, I'm using the light lister here. And as I am adding my lights, I will most likely have to adjust my exposure value again. So I'm adding my lights here. Of course, this is um, 3ds Max Design 2012. So you understand that 2013 has a way better uh, quality, visual quality. So if I would do that on the 2013, the quality would be better, but you can still see the effect here. And once I have reintroduced my artificial light, I'm going to hit render and I'm going to have a very nice quality, but I might have to readjust the exposure control. Obviously, I do have three final gather bounds because I'm still in the interior scene here. So three final gather bounds, very important, and I'm going to have a nice result, right? So same thing is, is valuable here to fine tune your final gather solution. Go with the white, you know, over, um, overwrite material, white scene, and adjust your final gather solution. So this is what happens if you forget to remove the mental ray sky shader. Right? If you hit render, this mental ray sky shader is very bright, lots of weird reflection happening, and it's a complete disaster because you're going to fight with that and not going to be able to create a really realistic rendering. It happens a lot, um, and I get that a lot on the area, for example. People are trying to create night scene and they forget to remove the mental ray sky shader. A uh, couple of tips, you know, use the overwrite material. Uh, use IES data information from the light manufacturer, very important, and turn off the final gather. Sometimes that's what I do. I turn off the final gather solution, I find, like in the rendering, but turn it off, final gather. And I try to understand the direct light. Like right now, this rendering is only direct light. Because sometimes you place light and you're like, you know, it's bouncing everywhere and it's really hard to know which light does what. If you shut off final gather, there's no longer any bouncing light or secondary light, and you really see the cone of light, where the shadow lands, what's happening, you know, what that light is, how far that light is going. And then you turn on again final gather, and you see, you know, the effect of global illumination. But sometimes it's a good idea to turn it off and see the effect of it, to understand the cone of light. Uh, Keep in mind that if you use an overwrite material, let's say like in this scene I'm using an 80% overwrite material, 80% uh, reflectance, so it's very, very bright. And in fact, if you look at my room, the walls are quite dark, the ceramic is quite dark, the chair, the carpet. So you have to choose an, an overwrite material that is similar to what your scene is. So maybe for this scene I would use maybe 20% reflectance. And if you bring back the material, you might have to readjust the exposure control because the material might be darker than what the overwrite material was. And refine the, the um, final gather position. We just reviewed it, so this is also valid for this scene. Any question for the still images so far before I move to the animation? Everybody's following? It's not a completely different solution. It, you can tie it with Final Gather. You can use both. You can use GI, and on, on top of it, you use Final Gather to smooth out the solution of your GI calculation. Personally, I don't like using GI because it takes a lot of time to fine tune. They really, really need to know what, what you're doing. So I use it for, 
Yeah, you can use, when you use GI, not really, you also use final gather on top of it. So you use in combination. Um, but, you know, I use global elimination so for a very, very specific case where I need, um, what do I need it for? Sometime like a very, like, let's say I have a glass and I have a light and I want to see the ray of light bouncing on the table next to it in a very close-up shot. You know, very precise uh, action that I'm trying to do, but you know, it happens maybe once every once or two years that I'm using GI. Yep. Uh, let me ask you about the top render elements I'm using are depth of field. So, um, uh, what is it called? It's not called depth of field, it's called Z depth. Uh, that's the one I render all the time. I always render an alpha channel and I'll often render. Um, an out, like a material, uh, well, I'm losing my words today, um, material ID. So let's say, you know, I'm not sure on the floor wood, my client can't decide between, you know, dark wood and the light woods, or maybe he's going to put a carpet at the end. Well, I'm going to render a material, like a, a render element with a material ID for that um, particular object, so that I can replace it really easily and just re-render that part. So those are the ones. I'm not a huge on post-processing because I don't have time to do a lot of post-processing. And for me at Autodesk, I want to show you what you can do with the software and not with post-processing because you can, you know, render a very boring image and post-process it like crazy and it looks fantastic. But that's not showing you the potential of 3ds Max. So I don't use a lot of post-processing. Nowadays, I use it on the material level. The question is, like, do I use post-processing for uh, ambient occlusion? Before, I used to um, use ambient occlusion as a separate uh, render element, but now I just include ambient occlusion at the material level. So I render it as part, part of the render. So it's not a different step. It's part of my render, so I don't need to deal with it later. Any other questions? Okay, let's move into the animation because... Um, I only have about 20 minutes left, and it's a little bit uh, of, of information here that are quite important because animations are also a little bit difficult to fine tune, and you'll end up uh, having a lot of flickering. It's not really pleasant. So basically, before, what would happen is that you render an image, and it looks like this. And you go like, oh my god, what am I going to do? Major flickering effect. Everything that I've talked about for still images is valid for animation, but you have to think about this. When we render a still image, we have a final gather solution per image, right? Now, if you render 50 images, which each an individual final gather solution, every final gather rays are sent randomly in the scene. If you look at each of these images, one after the other, really fast in the movie, they're going to look like this, because they all use a different final gather solution. So the rays are sent differently. Yeah, per image it looks fantastic, but each image will be slightly different in the final gather solution. So that's not really good. So we had to come up with a solution uh, to, come to, to, um, f to uh, smooth out the solution, right? So same thing here, I have quite a bit of flickering. It's not really good. So basically, for still images, we render a unique final gather map file. Uh, but rendering, when you render a, se a sequence, if we keep rendering a unique final gather map for each image, the render output result will be calculated based on a different final gather map for each frame, which is not good. So when looking at each image, it will have flickering, which is not really good. So. In version prior to 2012, which version of Max are you guys using? 2012? 2013? Okay. Nobody, is anybody using 2010? Good. Awesome. Because before to 2010, this is a solution that we come up with after in the version of 2011. So before 2010, what would happen is that we would have a final gather solution for the complete render. But what happened is that the points weren't appropriate to the object, so I render a diagnostic here, and you'll notice that 
my objects are moving, but the final gather points are like camera based and they're flat in front of the camera, so the objects are moving, but it's, it creates this flickering action because the points are sliding on the object. So that was, that's why it was creating this ghosting effect. So what we did is we come up with two different solutions because there's three different case scenario when you're rendering an animation. You're either going to render a, uh, you know, a moving camera with objects that are still, or you're going to render a still camera with objects that are moving, or you're going to render both a moving camera with moving objects. So there's three different case scenario for animations, right? So to end all moving object, one final gather file per frame is processed in a first pass. When the beauty passes render, final gather points are interpolate across multiple frame. So remember the interpolation? For animation, we're going to interpolate over multiple frame to smooth out the solution of this final gather solution that is render per frame. That's the solution, right? <coughs> now to render uh, a moving camera, to, render, to end all camera movements, final gather points are shot from several locations along the camera path. So we divided the camera path into different sections. And final gather points become locked to the geometry, removing the sliding effect of those points. Right? So you see the points are locked to the objects now. They're no longer sliding on the objects. So these are the two solutions. And of course, if you have both, moving object, moving camera, it's a combination of these two solutions. Right? So let's have a look at how this, what are the settings uh, of, of these um, different uh, case scenario. So still camera and animated object. So this is the goal that we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve a very nice render uh, solution with objects that are moving, right? And the, the red action that you're seeing in the ceiling, at this level here, is when the couch is passing through the light, the light is reflected on the couch and it's creating light, a red light effect on the ceiling, right? Very nice effect. Okay, so to render animated object, Basically, we're going to render one frame, one final gather solution per image, but we're going to interpolate across a number of final gather solution per image. So, when you render um, animation, there's a two-pass process. You first, you render the final gather solution. Then, you render the beauty shot. So, the first part, let's have a look at this next slide so we can see it in the software. So here I have my scene with a still camera and moving objects. The first thing you need to go to do is make sure that first you're rendering an animation. So you open the rendering panel and you make sure that you're rendering a range or an active segment. Right? So now that I'm rendering an animation, I'll be able to uh, adjust the settings. Then I go under the indirect elimination tab, scroll down, and I say one file per frame, and it says next to it, thanks to me, Best for animated object. I always like to know what I'm doing, right? So this is a really good indication. Well, fine per frame, best for animated object. This is my case scenario. I'm in business. So the first pass is to render the final gather solution. I don't want to render the beauty shot. So I need to tell it, only render, <coughs> sorry, only calculate the final gather and skip the final rendering. That's what I'm going to do. <coughs> then I'm going to say, Final gather map, incrementally add final gather map per file. So from one final gather map image per frame is going to incrementally add the final gather map. Then I'm going to save that. You know, this is a final gather map solution. I'm going to save it somewhere to my desktop or into my project folder. I'm going to name it. I say save and I'm going to hit render. So what it's going to do <clears throat> it's going to render the final gather map solution first. It's going to give me this weird pixelated render. And it's going to render one final gather map per image for each of the image included in my animation. So it's going to go and render. So that's a bit of a long process. So allow yourself some time, depending on your final gather map solution. So you see here, it's starting to render. 
And once I'm going to be finished, you know, half an hour, an hour later, I'm going to have one final gather map per image, right? So you see 0, 01 all the way to 150. So then I'm going to go back to my rendering panel. I'm going to make sure that I'm rendering a frame. Now, the reason why I'm changing the range here is because I'm going to interpolate across a number of, of frame of images, right? So if you're rendering the beauty pass of image number one, well, you need two frames before the frame of the, the image you're rendering and two frames after. Well, if you're rendering camera one, uh, image one, you didn't render minus, you know, one and two. So there's no two frame before. So you need to start at number three in order to have the images, the final gather map before to do the interpolation. If you don't do that, it will tell you in the mentory rendering panel that you're missing the, the frame to do the interpolation. No, I would, I would suggest that. No, I have tips after that will answer that question. Okay, I have tips after for that, you'll see. <clears throat> so, uh, what am I doing here? Sorry, I stopped talking. <laughs> All right, so I'm doing, I'm changing the range to number three to 147. <laughs> and then I'm gonna save my beauty pass. And I'm gonna make sure to save it somewhere on my, on my machine. And then I'm gonna go to the end direct elimination tab. And, you know, I'm adjusting my final gather map for sure. Make sure that you uncheck this little box because otherwise you're not going to render anything. Common mistakes, you'll do that once and you'll never forget it again. And then instead of the final gather map, I'm not going to incrementally add FG point now. I'm going to use the final gather map that I've already rendered. Right? Read from final gather point. And see, this is the interpolation number here. You can increase that if you have a very complex scene or your camera is moving really fast. You might interpolate over a higher number of frames, but two on average is good enough, right? Now, because I'm interpolating over a number of frames, you can imagine that the amount of points that are interpolating is huge because it's times five now. It's two frames before and two frames after in the frame of the image. So the interpolation number will need to be increased dramatically, two to three times the interpolation number. So you need to interpolate all of these points that exist in all of these frames. So you need the interpolation to be cranked up in order to smooth out the solution. If you forget to increase the interpolation number, you're still going to de deal with uh, flickering, which is not good. So something that sometimes gets forgotten as well. So I'm going to increase that to 500 and it's gonna give me really nice results. So it's gonna go ahead and start rendering my uh, beauty pass. Only the beauty pass, it's not rendering the final gather anymore. And it's giving me nice results, right? So basically the result is what I had earlier. Do you wanna see it again? I just wanna speed up a little bit here because I only have eight minutes left. So basically the result is really nice and smooth. Uh, okay, so fine tuning, higher precision quality. Obviously, when you do an animation, you know your reflectance precision, your reflection precision, uh, you know your, your glossy precision. They'll need to be a little higher in order to avoid this flickering. Uh, the interpolation over the number of frame needs to be higher. Like I said, the first few frame and last few frame will not be able to interpolate because they need the existing frame before. Um, and you can define a job uh, on the network, obviously, right? Network rendering plays a big uh, importance when you're doing animation. Okay, the second case scenario is uh, animated camera and still objects. So this is the next case scenario. So I have a moving camera, but there's no object that I'm moving. Very common for architecture visualization. So what do we need to do here? This is the much faster solution because you only need to render your final gather solution once. What you do is you divide your camera movement into segments and you're gonna shoot the final gather rays into these segments. So I'm dividing my camera path 
in two different segments, and I'm rendering the final gather solution only once. Very quick to render. We like that. So basically, let's have a look at the settings to create this type of animation. Okay. So here, I have my scene. And this is a moving camera and still objects. So again, I want to make sure that I am rendering a uh, active segment, you know, 150 to 300, whatever the segment is. I'm rendering an animation. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to go under the indirect elimination tab, and I'm going to change that to project point from position along the camera path. Okay? And then the settings will show. Divide camera path by number of segments. So this is really depending on your scene. If your camera moves really fast, short distance, maybe night segment will be enough. If your camera covers a very long path, you're going to need to divide it into more segments. So the more segments you have, the more refined your final gather solution will be. So it's scene dependent again. So I divide into 36 for this particular example. And then again, I'm using, I'm doing the final gather pass first. So I'm going to say a uh, single file only. And next to it, it says, obviously, best for walkthrough and stills. Love that. So I know what I'm doing. So and then I'm going to say skip final rendering and only render the beauty pass, the, sorry, the final gather pass. And I'm going to say increment so I can save my final gather map. And I'm going to give it a name. And I'm going to say save, and I'm going to hit render. And what is it going to do? Is it going to give me this wet render, really weird, which is divided into 32 segments, right? But it's only one time final gather map. So it's like you're rendering only one image. That's why it's really quick. So then you look at the solution. You only have one final gather map. Then you're going to go back, and under the, you know, you're rendering the segments again. You know, give a name to your beauty pass. Save it onto your desktop, and then go back into the uh, fi reuse final gather, and then make sure that uh, you uncheck the uh, skip final rendering, and make sure that you read the final gather point for next existing map file, and you're going to hit render, and it's going to render all of the images that you need for your animation. Very simple to do, and it gives you very nice results. So that's the results that we're getting here. Very smooth solution. Nothing is flickering. Very happy with that. Now the last case, oh, sorry, give me some, 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 some um, fine tuning here. Basically, the only thing that you need to fine tune here is the segments. So like I say, more distance, more segments, faster, more segments. Always go with higher amount of segments because it's always going to give you a very smooth solution. But if you need a quick render, you know, you might want to just do a least amount of segment. The more segment, obviously, the, the longer this uh, specific final gather map will be to render. Animated camera and animated object is our last case scenario. So basically, here we have both a moving camera and moving objects. Right? Ta -da, both activity here. So let's see what we need here. We need the solution of both. So we need to render one final gather map per frame. And each of these final gather map needs to be divided into segments because it's a combination of both. So it's going to create a lot of final gather points, obviously. Right? And I think I've read the diagnostic. So you see the density. You see where the segments are, actually. You see the lines where the segments that I've divided my path into are in a density of point, which I thought was quite interesting to show. Right? And the points are really dense on the objects because they're attached to the objects. They're no longer sliding on the objects, especially on that chair that's moving there. Very interesting. All right. So let's see how we do the settings. OK, got two minutes left. OK, so I have my animation. So I'm going to make sure that I'm rendering an animation first. And I'm going to save it. So the first thing, you go under the indirect elimination tab. And you make sure that you choose project point from position along camera path. So you're dividing 
your camera pot into segments. And you're going to choose the amount of segments that you need. Then you're going to scroll down and say, render a single file. No, sorry. Render one file per frame, which says best for animated object, and only calculate the final gather map. And incrementally add final gather map so we can save it under a certain name. So I'm going to go ahead and click render, and it's going to divide my camera into my uh, final gather map solution into segments, and it's going to render one file per frame. So each each frame will be looking the same. They're all going to be divided. So once I'm finished, I'm going to have one file per frame that has been divided into segments, right? Then once I'm finished to do that, I can go back under the indirect elimination tab, make sure that I'm rendering an, an animation again, go under the indirect elimination tab, and choose, uh, oh, I'm going to have to increment my uh, interpolation in just a second. So I'm going to go ahead and uncheck the final, skip the final rendering. I'm going to say read the final gather point for the existing map file. And, and I'm going to interpolate over two frame. And I'm going to need to increase the interpolation number because I have a lot of points here. So I'm going to increase it to 500. And I'm going to hit render. And I'm going to have a very nice result. Right? So remember the animation results. And the fine tuning is like basically the first few frame again. And the last few frame won't be rendering because it doesn't have the frame to interpolate. You're going to have to increase the interpolation number, interpolation number, and the more segments you have, the smoother the results, right? And of course, final gather map solution that I explained to you in the still image, how to fine tune the final gather map solution is also valid for the animation, obviously, right? So you need to fine tune it and find the right solution first. So any questions on that? Yeah. Should what? Sorry? It could be done on the network. As long as the result is available to your machine. It doesn't matter wherever you save it. Does that answer the question? No, you can do a mental re, you can do it on multiple machines. There's no problem with it. Is there a, anything about the file naming that, that you need to do for the final gather map? Sure um, no, you can name it whatever you want, as long as in the, the, that Max can find it. Basically, when you name it, um, when you go back and do the, you render the beauty shot, you're going to say, read the final gather map, the name is still there. So it's going to find it automatically, unless, you know, you change something in between or whatever. But you can point it to it. It's fine. Yeah? If you say that again? Yeah. Well, caustic, to render caustic, you're going to need to use GI, global elimination with photon. So it's two different principles. But if, the, if your object is invisible to final gather, it, yeah, it's not going to be part of being a caustic. So it's going, to be, it's going to have to be part of the final gather solution. But if you're using photon, final, final gather solution is secondary. It's just to smooth out after, so it's a different principle. But the object will have to, go to be part of the... Yeah, we'll have to emit photons. Any more questions? Okay, last thing I want to tell you, you can find me online very easily. I have recorded a bunch of tips and tricks on mental re-rendering. All the, sh the videos that I show you today are part of my um, uh, YouTube uh, channel. So if you can go there and review that, I've included the, the, the link in the handout. Uh, and I've written a full white paper on this class that you can find on the Autodesk website. So you can download that, uh, you can download the white paper and use the summary sheet to make sure that you have a summarization of the steps that I've explained. Um, yeah, you can find me really easy, just Google Mario Landry. Um, I'm the one who answers a lot of questions on the area as well, uh, technical questions. I'm there to support the Facebook page. 
Uh, you can find me on Twitter, but mainly my YouTube channel is the best place to find me as I'm uploading uh, tips and tricks on um, 3ds max on a regular basis as well as showcase if you're interested in showcase so thank you so much and i really apologize for my voice i hope it was bearable <laughs> and i hope you have a good party tonight <laughs>